So let's try to finish this message about don't go back the way you came. We talked about five things from 1 Kings. Nikki was saying this morning, she sent me a text, the word is like a hammer. What does a hammer do? Does it hit something once? Does it hit something twice? If you're really good, yes. I've seen some guys swing a hammer and knock a nail in, right, Tony, in two swings, not me. Three swings, then I have to tap it back to be straight again, put my hand in there, hit it again. But that's how the word of God is. It's like a hammer over and over and over again. When we read scripture and say, oh, we already read this, don't let the enemy trick you. Read it again and have it come alive. So let's look at 1 Kings, if you wouldn't mind. And we're looking at uh, chapter 13, verses 8. And we'll read a little bit of this, starting at 8. We're talking about, we left, if we weren't here last week, we're talking about don't let your guard down. And I encouraged you about when you get a word from someone, it better just be confirmation of what God's already speaking to you. Not just someone telling you, I had a dream, I had a vision, and you say, oh, you did? And then you pick up your family and you move somewhere or you leave a church or you change a job off what man's telling you to do. When man says something to you, it should just be confirmation about what God's already put in your spirit. And I used Jasmine and Carrington in their way this week about how God spoke to us in January that they would be taking over youth ministry, but we didn't say a word. And then the Spirit of God told them four months later, and then we said, yes, we know that. And we spoke over them, but it was confirmation about what God was already telling them. And so don't let your guard down and think, oh, it's a believer, it's, a, it's a, another Christian, or you better know that you know that when somebody tells you something, it's just confirmation in your spirit. We talked about testing the Word of God. We talked about God's Word is not double-minded. Far too many times people get a word and, and do all this stuff, and then six months later they go, well, none of this worked out. i got to go back and backtrack. God's not a backtracking God. And so you better know when you get a word from someone or, or someone tells you that a dream or a vision, it's just confirmation in your spirit where your spirit links up with that and says, yes, God's already been dealing with me in that situation. And let's look at what happened here with the prophet that didn't follow those guidelines. Verse 8 says, but the man of God said to the king, even if you were to give me half of your house wealth, I would not go with you or eat or drink in water in this place. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you should not eat bread or drink water, nor shall I return the way you came. So went another way and did not return that way. Now there was an old prophet living in Bethel, and his sons came and told him everything that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. Their father said to them, which way did he go? And his son saw which way the man of God who came from Judah had gone. He said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it. And he went after the man of God, and he found him sitting under the oak tree. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Now, if God was really speaking to him, would he have to ask that question? Uh-uh, nah. That's, that's, that's the giveaway one right there. Are you the guy? If God spoke something to somebody, there's no question about it. When God tells you to do something, you do it, Amen. Then he said to him, come with me and eat bread at my house. He said, I can't return with you. No, I'll go with you or eat bread or drink with you in this place. For I was told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread or drink water or return by the way you came. He answered, I am too a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house so they may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So the man of God went back with him and he ate the bread at the house and drank the water. Now it happened as they were sitting at the table that the real word of the Lord came. And they both knew it. And he cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord, you have not kept the command of the Lord your God has given you. But you have come back and eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord said you should not eat bread and drink water. Your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. After the prophet of the house had eaten and after he had drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he had gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was thrown into the road with a donkey standing beside it. And the lion was also standing beside the body. And there was a man passing by and saw the body thrown in the road and a lion standing beside him. So they came and told about the city of Bethel where the old prophet lived. And we'll stop there. But as you can see, we talked about the command of the Lord. What's in the command of the Lord? And if we go back, there was five things I said. One is in the command who to talk to. And that was the king. The second thing was what to do, the plan. 
the word against the altar and what to tell the king. In God's command, there's what to say, there's what to do, there's who to talk to. We're talking about what not to do, the warning. The first week we talked about which way to go. And there's no future in your past. But today is the warning that the Lord has said. And the first one talked about not letting your guard down and don't go by what somebody's telling you. And this prophet tricked the man of God, but the man of God should have known better. God doesn't go back on his word and said, oh, now you can eat and drink. But he caught him in that time when he was hungry and when he was thirsty. We talked a little bit last week about uh, we, in Matthew 12 where the man was uh, healed and uh, set free of the demons, but the demons come back. And they come back harder and stronger to fill that house. And so it's up to us to fill our house with the word of God, with the things of God, with the spirit of God. Galatians 5.16, you'll have to turn there, says walk habitually in the spirit. So you won't cater to the flesh. Amen. So I want to turn you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 and 13. I'm reading from the Amplified. It says, Therefore let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, be, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. No temptation, regardless of the source, has overtaken or enticed you. That is not common to human experience. There is any temptation unusual beyond human resistance, but God is faithful. He compassionately and trustworthy, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation he has in the past and now and will always provide the way out. So you'll be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. The prophet had a way out. He just had to say no and keep going. But he was starting to get tired. He was starting to get weary. And we know that's where the enemy tries to come in. So we have to be aware on all fronts of everything the enemy is trying to do here. It says here, take care in verse 12 that you do not fall into sin or condemnation. Don't be overconfident. Don't be self-righteous. Be aware. 1 Peter 5.8 says what? Be sober. Be vigilant. We have to be self-controlled. The Bible, in that, when that term uh, sober means self-controlled, watchful. So you have to be watchful and don't let your guard down when, so, when something or someone's trying to knock you off course of what God's called you to do, where God told you to go. Many times, you know, through ministry and pastor doing things with the, with the, with the buildings and the properties, there's many times where the enemy tried to knock him off course. But how many times did he say, point this way and speak to that distribution center? And how many times have you hear a long time, we're going to pay the building off and we had bricks on the board. And over and over again, he didn't waver. And that's all you have to be. You can't waver. You have to be watchful and sober. So I'm not going to let my guard down for one second. I know what God told me to do and I'm going to do it. If you, God tells you something for your family, for your job, for your finances, hold to it. Be strong. Be watchful. Be sober. We know what the word sober means. It means not controlled by any other thing. Drugs, alcohol, things of this world, being dialed into the Spirit of God, self-controlled. When we allow the enemy to get us weighed down with the things of this world, we become not watchful. We don't have self-control. We're going by every whim and every feeling that we have. Then we're in trouble. So be aware. Turn to Philippians 4.8. Keep your mind sharp. And anytime I talk to somebody or counsel with somebody, that has dealing with something that they've seen, uh, pornography or, or some kind of tragedy or something, this is the verse I always go to. This is, this is the go-to verse for this. Because you keep your mind sh uh, sharp on the word of God. It says, finally, believers, are you a believer? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, that's God's word, it's right, it's honorable. Whatever is lovely, pure and wholesome, and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good re uh, repute. If there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Send your mind on them and implant them in your heart. The things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things in daily life. And the God who is the source of peace and well-being will be with you. Chosen generation, are you awake? The word of God is important. In Psalms 119.105, the word is a lamp unto my feet, church, and a light unto my path. There's your scripture verse, kids. I had to sneak it in my message. But it says here in this verse, 
If there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Send your mind on them and plant them in your heart. That's the God's word. Your word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We know that we live in a dark world. We know that doom and gloom is out there. But if the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, we'll never take the wrong path or where we go. Amen. That's how we keep our minds sharp. We got to keep pride away when it comes to not letting our guard down. Let's look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, verse 12. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be raised by honor. And let's look at James 4. Let God be the one that exalts you, church. Keep pride away from thinking that you've arrived. You know, the prophet's sitting under the tree going, I delivered the word, it was tough, I made it, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. This guy sounds like he's got it all together. I'm just going to follow him back home. That's when pride comes in. Pride comes before a fall, amen? James 4, 6. But he gives us more and more grace through the power of the Holy Spirit to defy sin and live an obedient life that reflects both our faith and our gratitude for salvation. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud and haughty, but continually gives the gift of grace to the humble who turn away from self-righteousness. So God will always give you a gift of grace to get through whatever situation is. We can't say, well, it's, I'm going to take over and I'm going to do it now. You know, Jesus, when he was tempted, could have said that many times in the garden. And the devil used the word of God to try to trick him. But he wasn't so easily tricked. He didn't let his guard down. He wasn't going to talk and use pride and say, wait, I'm the son of God. You're right, I can do that. No, that's not what the word of God said. He knew that his father was still above him. Amen? And I've been joking with people, you know, now that dad's gone to be with the Lord, I can't hide from him. He sees everything I do. And I always remember that when I'm trying to do something sneaky that I shouldn't be doing or, or cutting a corner, not having a spirit of excellence. I'm saying, oh, dad's watching. And he's sitting next to Jesus going, I told them, make sure he picks that up. Amen? Don't rely on your own understanding. You don't have to turn there for sake of time. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord. Not, lean not on your own understanding. Is it easy to rely on our own understanding? Especially when we come through a victory, especially when God uses us, we start to think, I've arrived. I've, uh, here I am. I think that's what's happening in the, around the world in churches today with sometimes pastors and, and evangelists. They're just saying, oh, I'm doing it on my own now. Look how successful I am. And they're starting to get away from what God's really told them to do. Spreading themselves thin. Neglecting family. Neglecting the church that God's given them. Don't rely on your own understanding. Say, God, I'm going to trust and rely on you. You give me the direction to do what I need to do. That's a guard. The last one, don't trust your own strength, Philippians 2.13. For it's not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work that is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. So don't think for one sec second you've arrived and you can trust your own strength. We got to link our strength and our abilities up with the strength of God's word because he effectively works through us. Amen. So we can't allow ourselves to get caught in, in the moment living. We talked a little bit last week real quickly about not listening to other voices. And we used Adam and Eve as an example. They had the word of God that said, don't touch the tree. But then another word came that sounded good. That said, well, doesn't God want this for you? All, this is the stuff that we get caught up when we're not following exactly what the Lord's telling us. We get in the moment living and say, that sounds good. That looks good. That's kind of right. But we have to know by discernment and know that, wait a minute, that's not exactly what God told me to do. You know, when you get a word from God, there's a peace and a confidence that, am I right? You hear God tell you to do something. Uh, there's a family, there, they've been going through some stuff uh, physically, and thank you for continuing to pray for Ryan. He's getting better and better. Prayer requests came in, his eye actually straightened out, and that tumor's shrinking, and it's going to shrink. Amen? But he's not able to work, and his wife has, has been working, and they've been doing okay, and someone in the congregation handed me a check last week and said, the Lord put them on my heart and gave me this weird number to give them. And how I many of you know the story when Pastor was without a job, his mortgage was $423. How many would like to have that mortgage payment? Amen. And someone told 
the, them to write a check to, to pastor for $423. And they wanted to give 500 because they were like pastor. They are round uppers. But God said, no, 423. Pastor didn't tell the church what the mortgage was. And when he got the check, it was, he had wrote the check for 423 with no money in the bank and then went to the mailbox and there was a check for $423. I'm not telling you to not pay your bills and, not, and write bad checks. He struggled with that, but he said the Lord told him that peace, this is the point, came over him to say, I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to show you $423. So this person wrote a check for $464 and said, I don't know why. I called Ryan up. I said, Ryan, you know, went and prayed with him. I said, the, the body of Christ is being a blessing to you. This is a weird number, but I want to know why. He says, my wife got up this morning, was praying about our finances. I'm going to call and tell her. I got a text from him about 20 minutes later that said there was two bills that equaled $464. $464. Again, the person that gave me the check said I wanted to give more, but God said this weird number and I couldn't get away from it. So when God tells you to do something, there's peace, there's joy, there's excitement, there's not confusion. And so don't go back on when God tells you that. And when God gives you a word, don't let your guard down and say, but I haven't seen it happen yet, but let me add a little bit to it. Let me take away from it. No, take the word and the command. This scripture that we looked at in 1 Kings chapter 13, the command and the word of the Lord came to the prophet. God gives you commands by the word every single day. The spirit of God inside you, God speaking to you. Be obedient to that. Don't get caught up in living in the moment like Adam and Eve did and heard some other voice change what God said to them. So I want to look at a couple more, if I can, in this short time that I have. Uh, let's look at Esau. And so what the Lord said to me here, the first one was a desire for more in the moment. That was Adam and Eve. They wanted more. They didn't need more. They had everything. But that's living in the moment. We have everything that we want more before God's given it to us. God said, everything in the garden, but don't touch this tree. The next one is being short-sighted or satisfaction for right now. The natural game in, in this moment, the right now. We know the story of Esau. He was tired. And his brother tricked him out of his birthright. And so he was more interested in eating than he was in keeping his birthright. And so we have to make sure that the things of the moment, the natural game in the moment, never overtake what God has given us. And the importance in that birthright. Let's look at Philippians 4, if you're still there, verse 11. He sold his birthright for what was important at that moment. That right now satisfaction. You know, that's what happens when sin wants to come in. Sexual sin, sin with an addiction, sin with watching pornography, sin with cheating, sin with lying. It's that quick gratification for right now to get satisfied for what you want right now. And I'm sure Esau's like, eh, I'll get it back from him later, but I'm hungry right now. But he lost it. And the enemy wants you to lose everything. And that's why we look at the world, you know, especially when I've talked to the kids for many times over the years, you know, they look at their friends and how their friends are living and nothing's happening to them because the enemy knows he's got them wrapped up. They're not going anywhere. But you know when the godly person wants to take one step outside of the will of God or outside of that protection, the enemy's there like a roaring lion ready to snatch them right up. We as the body of Christ, we don't get second chances when it comes to sin, church. Many, many a times we've heard, I, this is the first time I did this, and boom. Well, yeah, because the enemy knows he's only got pinpoint opportunities to snatch you out from under God's will. This opportunity he saw just to snatch up his birthright because he was hungry. Don't let the desires of this world and the satisfaction for right now let you have your guard down. Let's look at Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak from any personal need, for I have learned to be content and self-sufficient through Christ satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or uneasy, regardless of my circumstances. The enemy's constantly after our contentment. He wants us to be unsettled. Learn to be content whatever state you're in, never based on what everyone else is doing or what anyone else is doing. Just content in what God's given you. Be content. God's supplying my needs right where I am. Sure, I want this or I want that. I'll give it to the Lord, but I'm going to be content. I'm not going to let it consume me. I'm not going to be moved about that satisfaction for the moment. I want to be content. 
That's why I like this verse. Uh, For I've learned to be content, self-sufficient through Christ. It's only through Christ that satisfies you. And so when we draw ourselves through Christ, we're satisfied with all that we have. And that doesn't mean God doesn't want to bless us and, and give us more than we our heart's desires. I've been living a godly life my whole life, and God has blessed me greatly, my family, my children, in, in financial realm. But at every step of the way, I've always been content. I've always said, I'm not going to. I'm going to wait it out. Buying a car. This is what I really want. It's not working out. I'm going to be content with, with, with this. I'm not driving a clunker. But there's other things in, in, that have come across vacations. Oh, I'd like to do this. Give it to the Lord. Didn't work out. I'm happy with what we're doing. I move forward. God satisfies me. But then, you know, we get caught up and we say, but I want this and I want this. And I see this person and, I, and th- that, that not contentment and wanting more. God said, just chill out. I got you. I'll satisfy you right where you are. Amen. So someday I'll have a Corvette. No, I'm just kidding. I don't want a Corvette. I'm totally kidding. I can't even fit in them. So, I remember I wanted a Camaro Z28 and IROC when I was a kid, and my dad just said, uh, you won't be able to leave the driveway in the winter, so you're not getting one. So, He taught me all about rear-wheel drive in the Northeast and said, don't ever ask for one that's rear-wheel drive. So now they make sports cars that are front-wheel drive. But now I don't care because I'm content with what I have, and I don't care about the car anymore. But back then, I really wanted that IROC with T-tops if I'm dating myself. Right? Okay. So let's look at 1 Timothy, chapter 6. When we're not content, it causes us to let our guards down. That's what happens. The enemy's looking for any little thing that he can. Let's look at 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 9. But godliness actually is a source of great gain when accompanied by contentment. That contentment which comes from a sense of inner confidence based on the sufficiency of God. But if we have food and clothing with these things, will we be content? But those who are not financially ethical and crave to get rich with a compulsion, greedy longing for wealth, fall into temptation and trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, leading them to personal misery. So temptation causes us to get trapped. We're trapped, we fall victim to foolishness and harmful lust, which then lead to destruction. See, it's a a path that we get on here. It says here, great, uh, greedy longing for wealth, fall into temptation, then a trap into foolish and harmful desires that plunge you into destruction and ruin. So when we're caught up in not being content and wanting what we want because the world has it or we see other people with it, we let our guard down, we become uncontent with where we are. And that's a place that we can't get to. And that's what happened to Esau. Let's look at one more verse here on this one. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Verses 5 and 6, let your character, your moral essence, your inner nature be free from the love of money. Shun greed, be financially ethical, being content with what you have. For he has said, I will never under any circumstance desert you, nor give you up or leave you without support, nor will I any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake you or let you down or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So take comfort and be encouraged and contently say, the Lord is my helper. In time of need, I'll not be afraid. What can man do to me? So simply, church, there's no reason not to be content. Because if you think you're lacking, God never leaves you. He gives you all that you need at the time that you need it. You know, I said many times before, I was believing God to pay, to pay for the kids' college. And I said, God, I know you're going to take care of me. I know you're going to pay it. And then every time I paid the bill, I'm like, God, you said you're going to take care of the need. And then every time I paid the bill, God, you said, I'm waiting for this big check of just the one lump sum check. And as I'd gone through it, this year we're making the final payment for Nico. And the Lord said to me years ago, you are making the payment. I am taking care of you. You're not lacking. Sometimes we want, oh, no, I want to see God drop, you know, half a million dollars in my lap because that's what college is going to cost in a few years. I want to see that lump sum. But where's faith in that? It's like, okay, God, give me a plan on how to say it. Give me a plan on how to do it. And then I love writing that check and taking care of it. God supplies all my needs according to your rich, his riches and glory. We're not, we're, we're taking care of here at church, but we're not making above and beyond where we should. But God is our source and giving and tithing has brought back heaps and scholarships and, and monies. And I don't try to figure it out. I just like say, oh, there's enough in there. Let's pay the bill. 
And so God gives you all that you need and you're content in it. Sure, would I have liked to have seen the whole thing in the bank account? Who wouldn't? But when you trust God and say, when the time comes to pay the bill, the bill will be paid. How many of you know and know that in your own lives and sowing and giving, God takes care of you. But be content where you are. The enemy would like you to say, oh, but wouldn't you like to have a little cushion? A little? God supplies. He'll never leave you or forsake you. It says it right here. He gives you more than enough. He takes care of you. We're going to look at that in a minute. Some more. So that was Esau. Let's see if I can get through a couple of these quickly. The next one was David. Adultery, lust in the moment. Deception in the moment. Murder to cover sin in the moment. Lust in any form is a problem. It pushes you to the, uh, the uncontent realm of thinking. So you can have physical lust. You can lust for things. That's what happened with David here. In Psalms 51, you don't have to turn there. We know what he talks about here. He says, I'm sorry. I messed up. You know, here's a person who God said he's a man after his own heart. He was an adulterer, a murderer, a liar. So nothing you've done surprises God. But don't let your guard down because that's what happened with David. David should have been in the battle. David should have been at the, head of the, at the head of the army. I mean, really, what was he afraid of? He killed lions and bears with his bare hands. You know, I picture him, you see all these movies, Gladiator and Braveheart and all these things, and these guys run out there with one sword and, you know, they're killing everybody. That's how I picture David. Just a mighty warrior, but what did he do? He let his guard down. He let lust in. He went out on the rooftop and started to look over his kingdom. And that's when it came in. The Holy Spirit must be ever present in every decision that we make. You can write down Romans 8, you won't have to turn there, but it says to set your minds on the things, Romans 8, 5 through 11, set your minds on the things of the Spirit so you don't satisfy the cravings of the flesh. Do what you're supposed to do, be where you're supposed to be. Don't allow lust to get in there and change your thinking. You let your guard down. You start to look at what other people have. You start to lust after. You start to desire, and that's not what God has for you. And it, the funny thing with that whole story is David had plenty of wives and concubines. He needed, to, he needed to look for one more, but he let his guard down. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. He started lusting with his eyes in that moment. That's where deception came in. And look at the track record of what happened. But created me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit. And God called him a man after his own heart. So no matter what kind of background you thought you had, God can change it. Amen. Let's look at two more. Peter in the denial phase because he was scared of persecution in the moment. Let's look at Proverbs 29. We cannot be making decisions, church, worried about what people are going to say and think. That comes from what we stand for. We live in a climate, politically, political correctness. You got to stand up for what you believe and not be worried about what people are going to say and think about you. If you're a Christian, you're already on the wrong side. So you might as well just stand up for the truth in love, in kindness, but stand firm on your beliefs. Because Peter, we know, was a disciple. God used him mightily in the early church, but he had a moment. Because he was afraid of the persecution. Afraid of what people might say. Afraid of being knocked down. Afraid of being thrown in jail. Let's look at Proverbs 29 here, verse 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord and puts his confidence in the Lord will be exalted and safe. Let's look at Luke chapter 12. We should never be worried about what people think. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. It says, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have nothing more that they can do. But I will point out to you whom you should fear. Fear the one who after he has, has, uh, he has killed has the authority and power to hurl you into hell. Yes, I say to you, stand in the great awe of God and fear him. So really, church, what does it matter what people think about us? We need to stand up for the truth of God's word because judgment on us is far worse than what judgment of man says or does. God has the power to judge us to hell, that judgment, that final judgment seat, we're going to give an account for everything we've done. Amen? 
We should always be more concerned about pleasing God rather than man. Let's look at one more verse here, John, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, John chapter 12. So think about the next time you want to say, I don't know if what I'm going to stand up for, and don't worry about what Susie thinks, worry about what God's going to think. So John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, even, at, uh, even many of the leading men believed in him as Savior and Messiah, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess it. For fear that if they acknowledged him openly, they'd be put out to the synagogue, excommunicated. For, the love, for they loved the approval of man more than the approval of God. You know, I wish our leaders would be more concerned about the approval of God as opposed to a party, a group. And we have to make sure that that's how we're living. Christian means what? That's it. That's all it means. And so we should be walking, not worried about man's approval, worried about God saying, well done, good job, stand up. Again, in love. Because we're already behind and negative in every conversation we go to. Every time we want to stand up for something, we've already been labeled. We've already been told how we're going to react. So we need to work at, be more loving and more forgiving, but stand up strong and say, no, I knew the Messiah. Yes, I am Peter. Yes, I did walk with him. What is man going to do to me? But we can see that when we have those moments where we let our guard down, God can still use us. God forgives us. God's grace is upon us. But think about the damage that we can do in that moment. What about the people that Peter denied to? We don't know what happened to them. Maybe that was a moment for Peter to witness for them. That was the moment that God wanted him to say, no, serve the, the Messiah who just gave his life for you. So we don't know in those moments. Don't let your guard down. The last one, another disciple, Judas. The desire for earthly gain. 1 Timothy 6.10. Earthly gain. For the love of money, that is the greed and desire for it and the willingness to gain it unethically, is the root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through and through with many sorrows. So money's needed. We can't function without it. But the love of money and the love of status, that's where we get into trouble, when we let our guard down. Do you really think Judas, when he became a disciple, said, I want to be the one that... Betrays Jesus. You really think that's what he thought? But he let his guard down. He saw money that was more important. We don't know what he thought. Maybe he was thinking, Jesus will get out of this, but I'm going to get some money out of it. And even if he thought that, the love of money caused him to betray his Savior. And think about the depth of the betrayal. Not just, oh, there he is. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over, I'm going to embrace him and kiss him. I mean, think about it. We know the story. But think about that love of money and how it just gets inside and just tur turns us upside down. And we want that gain and we want that moment. You know, as we're watching the Olympics, you know, you see all these wet record holders and they want the medal. They would take every world record and every event that they had if they could get a medal for their country. But it's for that one moment. It's that one moment. Yeah, you'll be known as an Olympian, a gold medalist, but that one moment, that fleeting moment in time, we can't be driven by the desires and the things as well for that one moment of pleasure to say, or that one moment where we get, get what we want out of, out of the world and out of the things that, that money brings. Yes, we need money. And you got to use money correctly. And God gives us the ability as good stewards to use money correctly. But sometimes money gets in the way. You know, and we've seen over the years, many, many of times where people have come to the house of the Lord with nothing and said, you know, living in their car, you know, don't know paycheck to paycheck. God blesses them and God changes their life. And then all of a sudden, poof, they're gone. They got what they needed. And they quickly said, I got what I needed in the natural and I'm going to forsake my relationship with the Lord. And that's a scary place to be when money drives you that way. Let's look at this last scripture verse and the worship team can come back up if they want. Matthew chapter 6. Got my favorite verse lumped in here. But there's a little backstory on this verse. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Money should never control any decision that we make because money's not our source. 
God gives us the ability to earn our money. God gives us the ability to make wages and be a good employee and a good business owner or whatever it might be, but that should never control us. So 25, therefore I tell you, stop being worried or anxious, perpetually uneasy and distracted about your life as to what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body as to what you wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow seed nor reap the harvest nor gather the crops into barns. And yet your heavenly Father keeps feeding them. Are you not worth more than them? And who are you by, can, by worrying can add one hour or length to his life? And why are you worried about clothes? See how the lilies and the wild flowers of the fields grow? They don't labor nor spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, all his glory and splendor, dressed himself like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive and green today, and tomorrow's cut down and thrown its fuel into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry or be anxious. Perpetual and easy distracted. What are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? What are you going to wear? For the pagans eagerly seek after these things, but do not worry. For your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And here's my favorite verse. I live my entire life by this. Be for, for, uh, first and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after his kingdom, his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, the attitudes and the character of God. And all of these things will be given unto you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So God supplies all of your needs. Don't get caught up in the things of this world when it comes to money or earthly possessions. You have a desire, ask the Lord. Say, God, this is a desire. This is the kind of car I want to drive. This is the kind of house I want to live in. This is the kind of paycheck I want to receive. We've heard many testimonies of people saying, I need to get to a new level in my pay grade. I'm going to start sowing on that pay grade. And God has done it. And God has increased them. And so God supplies your needs according to his riches and his glory. But the key factor is to seek first the kingdom of God. Not get distracted. Not letting your guard down. Amen? Stay in the spirit so you don't get caught up in the moment of weakness that causes you to let your guard down. So we've gone through these scripture verses. This went way longer than I thought, but I know dad's probably laughing in heaven. I didn't go for two years on Kings 13, but like Mark 4, but... I know that God wanted to speak to us about what's in a word and what's in a command. There's so much in God's word and God's command for our lives. Amen.